Okay, everybody, welcome to uh, day uh, two or day three, depending on how your local schedule has gone, of the 2017 um, INSS uh, conference. Um, our shared activity today is a cross-site panel. This is a panel that we uh, started last year. Last year was the first time we tried doing this. Um, and uh, we like to examine uh, issues um, uh, that have, um, are related to our general conference theme uh, by having panelists distributed at all the different uh, sites of the conference. And so our, our panel for this year, uh, the title is uh, Technology for Smart Connected Communities, The Bridge and the Wall. And uh, we'd like to follow up on our theme of uh, smart connected communities um, that we've been uh, pursuing for the last uh, couple of days. Um, we've, um, uh, in the activities that you've uh, experienced at your sites, um, I, I think that you will have found that the panelists and the speakers and presenters have uh, gone about examining how smartness and connectedness are technological issues. Um, but since we're a network uh, uh, that, that researches social sustainability, our particular take on this um, has been to um, also examine them as social issues. And um, by examining those, we're, we're hoping that we can uh, uh, illuminate some of the and address some of the um, challenges uh, to inclusion and equity that might come from um, thinking of these exclusively as uh, technical issues. And hopefully, um, in the course of doing this, we may have also identified um, some, some issues that exist wholly outside of the uh, so, uh, social uh, technical system, or might even ha not have a technical solution at all. So um, we've done this, and, and what we're hoping we didn't do was um, to, to be too pessimistic about the uh, promises that technology uh, makes. And you know, um, let's face it, computers do some things very well. You know, we, uh, we have to confess they're good at remembering things, uh, recognizing patterns. You know, some, some people would say not just remember things, but not forgetting things is, <laughs> is the other way to put it. Pattern recognition, um, making impartial decisions, or rather impartially making decisions that have been uh, 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 set forth in algorithms that were fed to them by their humans. Um, but there are a number of things that they do well, and what we're hoping to talk about in this panel are cases where um, there is a lot of promise for technologies to make uh, positive social impacts. Um, we think that technology can help people overcome persistent limitations uh, when it's applied with care and discretion and intentionality. And so our, our panel that we've put together for today uh, will help us hopefully highlight um, some of those opportunities. So I want to introduce our panelists. We have four panelists um, that are going to present today. Um, and so I'm going to introduce them in the order that they'll present. Um, uh, just a brief, you, you can find additional uh, um, biographical information in the program um, that we have uh, online. Um, and then uh, uh, we'll start the presentations uh, shortly after that. So our first presenter um, is located in Baltimore. It's uh, Rochelle Hollander. Um, Rochelle is the director for the Center of Engineering, Ethics, and Society at the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and uh, her particular expertise is related to um, science and engineering ethics, uh, professional responsibility, um, and the ethics related to risk management. Um, she um, uh, will be addressing us uh, from Baltimore, as I mentioned. Our second presenter is Emma French, who's a research assistant at the Center for Urban Innovation at Georgia Tech. Um, she uh, uh, is a graduate of uh, Georgia Tech's dual master's program in public policy and city and regional planning. Um, and uh, her expertise or her study area for that uh, as she was pursuing those degrees was sustainable urban food systems, local open data policies, and resiliency planning. Um, and so we're looking forward to Emma's presentation. Our third presenter will be David Chavez. Uh, David is coming to us from um, uh, the, the uh, um, from Lima at the uh, Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. Um, he, his uh, research and teaching area is um, signals and communication theory, and he has particular expertise um, in how networks are established and used um, during critical situations. Uh, remote sensing and uh, telecommunications. 
Um, so we'll look forward to that presentation from Lima. And our final presenter is, is presenting from Charlotte, North Carolina, James Walker, who's the founder and CEO of Innovative Technologies, uh, I'm sorry, In Informative Technologies, which is a social enterprise um, that uh, researches and develops scalable market-driven uh, solutions uh, to the digital divide. And uh, his work, uh, we've really been fascinated with, as we've learned about it in, in Charlotte, he's developing an operating system that's able to take advantage of computers that would be disposed of because they're considered obsolete, but it allows him to redeploy those machines um, in a way that helps uh, bridge digital divide. So James uh, will be our final presenter from Charlotte. Let's uh, first go to Baltimore. Rochelle, I can see you on the screen. and. Um, Let's, uh, let's um, hear Rochelle's uh, presentation. Uh, we've been talking particularly about smart and connected communities. And of course, uh, that possibility or that potential grows from um, investments, uh, federal investments, taxpayer investments in research and development. Uh, over an extended period of time. Um, so uh, we need to look at. Um, yeah, we still can't hear you in Atlanta. What the criteria are for those investments uh, and whether they merit public support. So, um, so um, our justifications. The justifications for our support of federal research and development are generally based on their uh, potential to provide to the public value. Um, but if you look at the history of uh, public support for science and technology, um, you see that often it has relied on uh, sort of two kinds of. Um, Congressional coalition. Well, for now, let's support these efforts. And the coalitions are more support for military or defense or security research. And the coalition is support for uh, research for competitiveness, so research for uh, developing um, new industrial products. Services. Uh, so what that means is that the um, while the rationale for these support is in terms of its public value, we haven't really paid adequate attention to where the benefits from our uh, taxpayer dollars are going. Uh, and now, if you look at um, uh, there's been a new development that is trying to look at um, developing criteria that can allow us to see whether what we're doing is actually creating public value. One of the, th the support for research and development has generally relied on a wealth producing model. That is, we do the research, we get increases in productivity, it produces wealth. In society. Um, we haven't really thought about our support for research very carefully in terms of its ability to um, promote equity. Um, now, this is uh, something that I see as changing somewhat uh, with um, increasing attention on the part of sectors in the public to whether, in fact, we are producing them, whether, in fact, we are making the connection between um, our research, the innovation that follows, and how, in fact, we create a more socially inclusive and equitable result in a social result. Um, so this alternative doesn't rely on the market, 
market success and market value. It looks at whether we have a public value success, a public value value. And see that what we're concerned about here are public values which one might think of as decent education, clean environment, uh, safe and well-paying jobs. Um, you could think about it in terms of um, green spaces. A lot of the things that we've been talking about in this community. Whereas market values are more in terms of what pays off in the marketplace. You might have low cost, you might have profitability. Um, and uh, sometimes if you go into the upper right-hand quadrant, you get public value success along with market success. Uh, sometimes you don't. Uh, you can look at uh, drugs and the development of drugs as a case where sometimes you can get both if you have a large-scale drug that has a large market. You get public values and you also get market success. But sometimes you really have to do something extra in order to get drugs distributed to the people who need them because the market is not to do that. Okay. So now, if, so if we look at the questions that arise with respect to smart and connected cities, yeah. you can see some of this in a recent example that came out of the report from the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, we have innovation in terms of, that really relies on uh, electronic communication in order to make those benefits of finding it easier to get uh, uh, the, the equivalent of a taxi to take it from place to place. Um, but it can, it causes problems that we took a long time to get over with respect to standard taxi services in terms of discrimination uh, that may face potential passengers. Um, there's discrimination that comes because some people don't have access to smartphones or to credit cards, which this model relies on. Um, so both exacerbate certain forms of discrimination, and you don't serve all parts of the market. Now, my final example is uh, an example of also a, a, uh, a technological innovation that um, is very small scale, but if we're talking about alternative technologies, appropriate technologies, this, this model uh, both uh, can does fits into that quadrant of both providing market value and providing especially public value. It adapts a technology for the use of a particular segment of uh, the um, less able community. And as in fact, um, it's quite a remarkable sight yeah. if you uh, if you watch these baseball games in the play, it's, it's really quite, quite something. So we can see that um, this uh, a reorientation towards using research and development in order to uh, create equity um, can be something that we could focus on. Uh, Emma French, uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, Emma, can you hear us? Um, so, hello, my name is Emma French. I just graduated from Georgia Tech dual master's program um, in public policy and city and regional planning. Uh, and I'm currently working at the Center for Urban Innovation and Research which I've been housed here at Georgia Tech. Um, so, over the past couple of years, I've gotten to do um, collaborate, lead various projects that relate to smart cities in a number of ways. Um, especially sort of the more practical side. Um, so I'm very interested in how we actually make smart cities logistically. What is the work that goes into creating these smart cities, right? Um, and also what sorts of policies are being proposed and passed that influence um, sort of smart growth and smart innovation? And then probably most importantly, 
see how are people on the ground actually using these new technologies and systems and services to actually uh, improve quality of life. Um, so I, I'm not an expert on any one thing, but I'm just going to briefly describe three projects that I've worked on in the last year, um, and hopefully that gives us some uh, material for, for questions and discussion. Um, so the first project is an ongoing uh, research project on legacy data. And so in this context, basically we mean any antiquated form of data. Um, so we, in our conversations about smart cities, I noticed that we are often talking about uh, real-time data, right, that's coming from these sensors. Um, but there's a lot of data that cities already have, uh, um, mostly in file cabinets, <laughs> that I think could be really useful um, to sort of fleshing out our understanding of how the existing city operates and how it has operated. Um, and I think this sort of historical data could be really useful um, in, in understanding how to best move forward. Um, so what we are actually doing is uh, going through the process of extracting data um, from the city of Atlanta's historic budget records. So going back to 1996, um, we've pulled these 400 page PDF documents um, of the city's budget and we are pulling out the interesting information and putting it into Excel documents so that you can actually search it and you, you can um, put it alongside other data in similar formats and, and um, draw new connections. Um, so this is a really interesting project. It's still underway, but some of the, well, one big initial finding um, is that we, city officials, and I think researchers as well, don't have a very clear understanding of the actual work that goes into um, extracting data um, and really building these smart cities. And so I think um, this is going to be, this is an interesting project and there should be more of this sort of work going on, I think, because it is still about the people, right? Um, the people still have to make the smart cities and they have to use the smart cities and live in them. Um, the second project, which sort of was actually the impetus for the legacy data project, relates more to open data policies. Um, so open data policies are being passed all over the world, um, and what we did was compared 12 city-level open data policies and basically evaluated them um, for their potential to increase government transparency, public participation, and economic innovation and growth. Um, so basically we, we read the policies and we extracted, we had created a list of proxy indicators which we felt would represent the policy's potential to increase these various um, outcomes. Um, and our findings in this case was that, uh, were that pretty much uh, it's not enough to have a policy. So a lot of cities have policies um, where they state uh, how important having sort of this openness is and how in support of transparency they are. But then if they don't actually have a requirement in the legal document saying we are going to publish the data on this date every year on this website, um, you know, in this format, and there's going to be, um, you know, these legal or license restrictions. If they don't actually specify these things, then um, we found that the data is not necessarily really open. Um, so that's something I think that needs a little more um, attention. And then the last project, really quickly, is looking at the use of smart city technologies in um, enabling uh, public engagement in planning. And so we used a case study of um, planning efforts around an urban watershed. Actually, it's just west of us right now, the Proctor Creek watershed um, here in the city of Atlanta. Um, and, and we were interested in a number of things. We wanted to understand how different stakeholders involved in city planning define smart city technologies. Is there a variation in that definition and how people understand technology? Um, how are those smart tools being used differently by different stakeholders? Um, and then how, what is the perceived impact of the use of these tools? So we spoke with professional planners, environmental scientists, um, nonprofit executives, business people, community leaders, and residents. Um, and the big takeaway from this project has been that technology, in some cases, actually inhibits participation. Um, and we were getting from residents 
it's a very clear message that they wanted more face-to-face -face, um, interaction in this, this planning process that you know, relates to their lives. Um, and that face-to-face -face, uh, was really important for developing a sense of trust and a sense of we are actually coming up with this plan together. Um, and so that was, that was just a very interesting finding. Um, and so just coming back to the topic of this panel, I don't think these projects represent failures or successes when it comes to smart cities. Um, but they're just attempts to contextualize smart city efforts um, existing or imaginary uh, in political, economic, and, and social contexts. Um, and I think that's something we really uh, need to be doing more as we talk about and um, develop these smart city initiatives. So that shouldn't have been 10 minutes, but that's it. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Emma. So uh, let's see, now we're going to move to uh, Lima, Peru, uh, David Chavez. Uh, I know in advance that I have just two minutes. And in this uh, short period of time for a, for a session lecturer like me, uh, I will try to do my best to greet you with uh, some comments uh, about the uh, work uh, we have uh, presented yesterday. Uh, First of all, um, I have to uh, begin by saying that um, the communities, the, the smart and connected cities rely heavily on telecommunication infrastructure and information services even to be acknowledged as smart communities linked and uh, networked uh, organizations. But uh, this reliance can be under severe stress whenever um, a seismic trigger emergency occurs, which is uh, something very likely to happen for uh, Peruvians, especially those of us living in um, the large cities along the Pacific, uh, the South Pacific or the Southern Pacific coast. Um, 2007 was uh, the year we had a very uh, uh, distressful episode that um, destroyed uh, several uh, towns and small cities around the uh, city of Pisco. Um, a couple of hundred miles south of Lima. Um, the damage was so severe that it compromised most of the civil infrastructure, roads, bridges, um, buildings, houses, schools, and hospitals, but also had a heavy impact on the whole Peruvian network. And Lima, which is a large city, about 10 million inhabitants as we speak, was uh, unable to use the telephone services, I mean voice services, as we call it in uh, the telecommunications jargon. Um, and cities in the north of the country, like Tumbes or Pura, were also affected in the same way. Uh, the um, anecdotic uh, side of this uh, sequence of events is that the Peruvian government, through his um, office in charge of um, telecommunication services, started an investigation. And this investigation was aimed at um, setting up a huge fine against the telecommunication operators at the time to punish the unavailability of communication services. Um, they ask for uh, counseling and advice from our engineering department here at the university. And of course, uh, we did not agree with the measure. We knew in advance that those things were to happen, 
and indeed happened. Um, and we prepared um, a letter to them telling that uh, there is no way that a, tele a licensed telecommunication operator would be in a position to cope with the huge increases in demand that occur whenever a, a, a large seismic event uh, happens in a large city like Lima. Uh, well, they did not pay um, much attention to our ideas. They went on with this uh, process uh, and the telecommunications uh, had to pay the fine uh, which was very large. But uh, after that, the government and the telecommunications community, I mean professionals, clinicians, and academics like us, uh, uh, learned that, uh, that we had to, to prevent society that uh, this might be a repetitive episode. Um, so here at the university, we took um, for us the task of developing a methodology for the assessment of the Peruvian network, especially under the stress, um, which is uh, the consequence of a, of a seismic event in the vicinity of, of uh, our large cities like Lima or Trujillo or Arequipa in the north and south of the country, uh, respectively. Um, yesterday, I said that uh, there is no way to um, do drills with the real network because it's in a production state, as we call it. Uh, and the only plausible way is by simulation. So we have been developing for over five years, we have been developing and improving uh, simulation methodology. Uh, and the easy part, of course, as you may uh, anticipate, is the inclusion of the technical aspects. I mean, everything that comes from networking, modeling, uh, the, the links, uh, the performance of the switches, controllers, servers, and all the things that um, allow the deployment of a large um, city scale network. But we were also forced to try to include the behavior of the general public, I mean the people who has access to a phone, to a smartphone, to a computer, to a home uh, plain and simple telephone, and first try to guess what is going to happen in the vicinity of uh, a seismic event, or a civil emergency as we call it, and in the few hours after that event. Uh, we had some ideas and uh, we tried to structure them into sequence of events. What do you do? Uh, how many milliseconds it takes from the awareness of you being uh, living this uh, dreadful situation? Um, going into panic mode or controlling yourself, uh, evacuating the building and trying to communicate with your beloved ones. Um, we um, wrote lots of code uh, regarding this uh, approach and we put it to the test. But then in the southern part of the country, um, a small city uh, with less than uh, 10,000 uh, inhabitants suffered at the end of 2013 and 
early 2014, a sequence of, of, of seismic events, uh, very intense ones, by the way. Um, and our university um, was in close contact with the people and the authorities of this city, which is called Akadi. And um, we were able to uh, make a survey with the people and ask them what really happened, what did they do, how did they communicate, and how did they fail to communicate uh, with the people that mattered to them in the aftermath of these uh, four seismic events. From from October 2013 to March 2014, they have four episodes. And by analyzing the collected data, we were able to um, discover and then structure patterns of behavior. Uh, for instance, a mother uh, who has uh, small children or teenagers and is not with them in the aftermath of the earthquake, by all means possible, will try to communicate with them. So she, if she has access to a phone, she will use it. And there's nothing in the world to stop that. That is one of the patterns we have identified and, and, and some others. And we went uh, a little bit uh, deeper uh, into that and we even um, include in our patterns the uh, retrials of the calls, of the services, of the denial of the services, and incorporated that into our simulation methodology. And after that, we've been watching very closely what the authorities here are doing in terms of trying to cope the um, network with these uh, abnormal solicitations, with this abnormal class of service that's going to be uh, faced in the aftermath of the, of the earthquake. Um, let me tell you that um, they uh, have not been uh, mm, very creative. The main message is uh, do not call, just uh, SMS or, or text, or you may know it. Uh, and um, if you indeed want to call, just call um, a bulletin board and there are very easy to remember number that you have to dial, which is 119. So we simulated that. And uh, one of the results of our simulation is that in, if in the vicinity of Lima, we have a movement uh, north of 5.5 in magnitude. The network is going to collapse. Uh, and the search in user demand will render the network useless. Um, and with that magnitude, uh, no tower is going down, uh, no link is uh, breaking up, uh, no fiber optics or uh, copper cable uh, wire is going to break, but communications will be um, in very poor performance or collapsed as a service. Uh, and then we scaled things a little bit up. We went to a 6.0, to a 6.5, and uh, to a, to a 7.0. Uh, may God never uh, put us in our living time in that situation. Um, and the effect was uh, consistent with our working hypothesis. The network collapses mostly by demand, and then as the uh, intensity and magnitude of the seismic event increases, 
um, some parts of the infrastructure might be compromised, but uh, the, the failure has already occurred because of surge in demand. So the next step is try to figure, creatively speaking, what to do, what measures to uh, set up in the network and in the people using the network in order to uh, try to uh, prepare for this imminent failure. And we have, uh, we have uh, devised uh, a dozen of, of measures. Uh, all of them can be really implemented. Um, and they range from a huge intervention in the programming, in the controlling, and in the management of the network components, which is something very uh, engineering biased. Uh, and as engineers, we know that we can do that. Uh, but there's one last measure, the 13th, that um, is very um, difficult to address because uh, engineers by ourselves cannot um, do our best in this field, which is, as you may expect, user behavior. So um, we need a society, Peruvian society as a whole to uh, address this, uh, this thing. And uh, our idea is to incorporate in the monthly or bi-monthly evacuation drills uh, that we all have to pass here in Peru, um, some steps, not just uh, about uh, how to get out of the room and how to look for the safest place, but also regarding how to use or not use telecommunication services, and especially not reaching the phone and calling your beloved ones uh, to know how they, how they did in the, during and after the earthquake. Um, so that is one of the, um, the main outcomes of our research. And it, it never stops. It, it keeps going. Uh, we're trying to improve the reach and the power of our simulation. So thank you very much. Very much, Dr. Chavez. Uh, we have one more um, panelist to present uh, from Charlotte, James Walker. I'll begin. So I'm James Walker. I'm the founder and CEO of Informative Technologies, which is a social entrepreneurship uh, venture that is based here on UNC Charlotte's campus and their incubator. I also uh, have uh, the honor of receiving Sustained Charlotte's 2016 award for um, being first place in driving social equity and empowerment through a model that I'd like to just walk through briefly. Um, our discussions about creating a socially sustainable city naturally, of course, will gravitate, as, as our Peruvian uh, correspondent said, towards engineering or civil society itself. But I would like to focus on the last mile. Uh, this particular panel uh, is about making sure we think about the social context of having improved infrastructure. We're supposed to have more jobs because of smart cities. We're supposed to have more educated empl uh, and employable citizens because of smart cities. But what has to happen is that in the house, the house environment has to also change. Let me give you an example here. So if you look uh, at your screen, um, you see our site, informativeinc.com. I encourage everyone to take a look at uh, the what if section. And we say, what if used, unused computers could be shared instead of scrapped? And we're talking more systemically than just refurbishing things or buying a, a, a used phone for half the price. We're talking about rethinking the whole process of e-waste. So using Charlotte as an example, Charlotte has, um, is in a county uh, that is over a million uh, in population. 
According to the library uh, system of Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, nearly one in five Charlotte area households are disconnected. What does that mean? They don't f fully have access to connectivity in terms of broadband. They don't fully have access to a device such as a laptop, and they don't fully have under, uh, a, a literacy of how to use these tools to improve their employability or help their students with their homework. So they're uncomfortable with technology. So this is why when you go to your public library, particularly um, in a large urban area, people are in line to sit at a desktop computer for an hour and wait to be kicked off and come back the next day in 2017. That is a problem that most tech companies completely ignore. We'd rather talk about driverless cars and landing on Mars. It's, it's, it's like, that's aspirational. But that's the reality of one out of five people you pass in the street. Um, when we look at the demographics, you look on the edge here, we see half of working class families are disconnected. Where does this come from? It comes from a Pew study, a, a brilliant study from a year and a half ago called the demographics of uh, device ownership in America. And what it did was ask a very specific question. We assume, 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 everybody's online. What happens if you actually ask, do you own a laptop or a desktop at home? And by the way, what's your ethnic background? And if you don't mind, what's your income? If you make $30,000 a year or less, you have a exactly 50% chance of saying yes to that question. And this was a two th late 2015. This is, you know, we're in mid-2017. This is not ancient history. This is not 1985. That's 50% of working class respondents said, yes, I own a computer at home, whether it works or not. If you're an African American, only 45% of uh, the community said yes. If you're Latino, roughly 65 or so percent said yes, which means that a third don't own a device. So that's urban, rural, a uh, lot of uh, working class families of different ethnic backgrounds, their main reality is either they or a family member ne next door to them doesn't have this new environment. And if we think of that as a last mile issue, then we need to think of what was the home environment when average American citizens, since we're speaking from a North American perspective right now, when was it that the average American citizen only had about half a chance of owning a computer. It's 1998. Okay, this is 2017, 1998. That's an entire human, near generation behind. So you might as well talk about flying cars and driverless cars and landing on Mars because you have the same home environment of someone who had a cell phone, watched Seinfeld, and went to the library to go, you know, do some homework every once in a while. And you're competing against people whose kids at four, year, four years old own a tablet and own the tablet. They know how to do everything on the tablet. How do you have equity in that environment? So this is where uh, being engrossed with the, the environment here at UNCC, I wanted to find ways to approach this systemically. And so I looked at other aspects of the problem, which is sustainability. There's obviously no shortage of computers being made. There's no, of course, quota you know, given out in a discriminatory basis of computers by your race or your class or your gender. But we do have something called planned obsolescence. So if you drop down, and this is not a tirade against any company, but you have the computers that Microsoft says, they have a schedule of what will be obsoleted by what year. We're in Windows 10, right? Windows 7 will be fully obsoleted, meaning completely unsupported if you get viruses, there's no upgrades for security or anything by 2020. That's been a part of their annual uh, stock uh, investor reports for the last uh, 10, or 10 years, ever since basically Windows 7 came out. Microsoft will say, these computers will be fully obsolete by 2020. That's 60% of the computers that are out there, by the way. We have Windows 10, and people might say, well, didn't everybody switch to Windows 10? Well, certainly you can't buy a Windows 7 computer. But if you can't buy a computer anyway, you don't have an extra $500 laying around just because November 2016 came around and Windows 10 is released. Well, you're going to be among, it's I think close to now to 55% of people who still have a Windows 7 or Vista or XP computer chugging away slowly with its viruses and its pop-ups trying to manage. So if you are of the half Particularly, let's think of the working class because we're thinking about how to raise mobility. If you're thinking of that half who do own a device, you own a device that's probably running XP or Windows Vista or Windows 7, 
uh, because you don't have the money to keep buying computers every single year, right? What does this mean? What, what, why does this, I say, is it is a systemic issue? It's because there's not a circular economy here. A circular economy is uh, what we think of in terms of a car. You buy your new car. Then your daughter needs a, her first car. Well, okay, you can, you can um, use the family car that, you know, we're not using so much now. We, we've bought another one. She goes to college. After she graduates, sells the car. And then somebody else has another car. And it's like the, the price of the car is low or free or given away. And you can ride Uber. And you can continue to basically make value out of that car until it's totaled. And then a tire company will buy the tires, and a scrap metal company will buy the steel, and it will be made into a new car and new tires. That is very efficient, right? Computers are linear. You buy it, you throw it away. That's like a soda can. And yet, unlike soda cans, people don't know that you can go recycle them. So this is the third point that I want to point, point, mention. EPA estimates 2.4 million tons of electronic waste went to landfills in 2012. So that's a five-year-old number. Obviously, our, our population has grown. Just alone, that would increase the numbers. But 70.8% of that, 2.84 million tons. So that's times 2,000 pounds, right? So billions of tons, was not recycled. It went to landfills. Roughly 30% are either stockpiled, like it's in our you know, junk drawer, the old phone and the tablet, or it's in our attic, or it's in our garage, or it's recycled. Um, that's, I guess, okay, uh, but we have to think about the fact that unlike a car, a computer is a machine that is just processing ones and zeros. It's not sitting in 100 degree weather in a, for half the year and freezing weather the other half of the year. It is just sitting on someone's desk crunching numbers. It is a completely preventable problem. It is just a difference of software. We focus on using open source software. Google, for example, many people, many people like myself who study computer science know that Google kind of does the opposite of Microsoft and Apple in that they open source everything. They can say, hey, if you can read source code and you want your computer to run Google apps, and uh, fine. Uh, you know, just don't call it Google and just don't call it Chrome. But just use generic names for it. That would be like Microsoft saying, yes, you could pay $110 to upgrade to Windows 10, or here's all the source code. If you know how to you know, compile code, you can have it for free. What do you think people would do? Of course, they would do it for free. Just take an take a extra step and, and, and learn how to do it for free. We focus on working with open source projects uh, to, that are very user friendly, that run the same apps, the app ecosystem for Android, the app ecosystem for Google Chromebooks, which are, by the way, 51% of the educational PC market uh, is now Chromebooks in terms of annual sales. They've completely eaten the lunch of Google, uh, of a Microsoft and Apple who've been in school since 1984, since I was born. Why? Because they have that kind of give it away mentality. You're just trying to get on the internet and we'll give you free upgrades for it. So we adapted that process to say, what if we can now say to companies, um, you're trying to be green, you're trying to be sustainable, and you're trying to also be a good social, uh, socially responsible corporate citizen, why don't you read, uh, direct the flow of your technology when you do a refresh project? My, IT, my background is in, uh, is in the IT industry. Refreshes happen constantly. Even if it's as an employee of a university, you get a new computer every three years. That means every year, a third of the employee base are getting computers. So there's a massive amount of waste that is generated because they have no room for an entire workforce of old computers that are no longer in use. We have a facility that we partnered with. It's a woman-owned zero landfill uh, uh, electronics recycling firm um, that is based actually in the north end of Charlotte, which here, Charlotteans will be able to do a, a foot tour of. And this is a smart city pilot area where we're trying to take an industrial, um, low-income area, moderate um, crime, moderate, uh, above average poverty, and drive job and, and innovate, job creation innovation there. So we run half of that facility. So we have the ability to take in from the entire 1,000-mile uh, radius of Charlotte uh, computers from campuses, from uh, other organizations, um, companies like AT&T, for example, and 
we sort them for reuse. If we if it truly is unusable, not because of a software glitch on one company's side, but it's truly unusable. It was a drop screen and it was completely damaged. They will, as a non landfill recycler find a use for every single component even the lead even the mercury and other companies buy that in order to rebuild technology more importantly though is what about the job creation piece how do we diversify IT for example so what informative does is something that is very interesting no other startup has approached workforce development organizations that are nonprofits that give uh, federal grant money to students who have barriers to employment to get work experience. So I said, well, I would love to do that. I would love to keep the margin, um, of course, high, but the price low. Let's say I want to have computers for $50. I want a laptop to start at $50. How do you ramp that up systemically? And it's not a giveaway, and it's not one grant that covered it, and it goes away. If I have a workforce that I don't have to pay for um, in terms of daily um, or hourly compensation, but they're paid $10 an hour, it's a perfect situation, right? All I have to do is train them. So what we've done is we have done thousands of hours of internships, dozens and dozens of students over the last year, and we have been able to get students from the exact same demographics that we're talking about, uh, young men and women, of African American and Latino and working class white backgrounds to work together building computers which almost none of them had at home. So they had no, not just the, just the experience of a full keyboard, like that level of uh, unfamiliarity. To go from that to is within two hours they've built their own laptop to keep and from there we teach coding and we teach how the internet works, we teach how to work on a team and every day they are actually producing technology that will then go to the library system. We have a representative here for the, the, for the district. We have uh, big brothers and big sisters, the YWCA the y, and various branches of the YMCA, just to name a few, who can then easily afford to create computer labs and to offer constituents this uh, low cost, uh, last mile solution to this technology barrier, working with, um, everyoneon.org, which provides uh, subsidized um, broadband. These essentially are um, $10 a month uh, broadband homes who are getting subsidized rates from AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile that have a $50 computer. That's something that can scale. And ultimately, if you look at the, the idea of a smart city, you have dozens of students each semester who will be able to serve and support those devices. So as you have a smart city, you have more infrastructure, you have more training opportunities, they can be the front uh, lines in helping modernize their own communities. As communities need networking equipment, they can set up the networking equipment. As communities uh, need entry-level so, uh, consulting services like setting up websites for businesses that we're offline, well, they too can be the ones who are at the front line. So you've actually created job opportunities and built resumes. So thank you very much for allowing me to share my model. Hey, uh, thank you very much, James. Um, we're going to now um, have a few minutes uh, for questions and answers. So I, I just pulled up our uh, question screen. It looks like nobody's typed anything in just yet. Um, uh, so go ahead and um, uh, type those in. If you're having trouble, or if people are having trouble in your room um, accessing the page, um, please either let us know via the text, uh, the chat function in WebEx, or at this point, um, you could just use a microphone in the room since we're not, um, we don't have any questions that we're actively answering. We'd like to focus on questions um, that are cross-cutting, so particularly ones uh, where the panelists uh, maybe multiple panelists could uh, respond to the question and have dialogue with each other um, as as we um, as they respond to them. So again, um, uh, uh, poll ev p o l l e v dot com forward slash inss uh, is is one way to get to it, or texting inss to uh, three seven six zero seven. And as the questions come up, we're, we're going to um, hope that the panelists themselves can uh, select the ones to, um, uh, to respond to. 
Okay, so it looks like we just got one in. Um, let the panelists read it, and um, as you have a response to the question, please just um, please just chime in. Okay. So, um, if I can. Uh, this is James in Charlotte. So the first question was essentially about making um, making sure that the rise of smart and connected communities um, don't lead to a further pu pushing away of low-income individuals from society. Um, I think this is tied in a bit to gentrification. So this is where I, I mentioned that if you think about that home environment is like 1998. Um, you're going to do something about it. If you're not aware of that, you didn't ask, you didn't do any asset-based community development to figure out who has devices in that neighborhood, who can give them away, who needs the devices and connect them. In my view, that would be uh, what's um, unfortunately might have been already uh, the process. We will have gigabit uh, fiber in introduced, and people have nothing to plug it into. They have a, a you know a track phone. Um, so I would love to hear any other. Um, feedback from other panelists. Okay. Um, hey, this is Emma. So we, sorry, I couldn't see the question at first. Um, but I mean, I think the work that that you're doing, um, James. Emma, you're, you're coming through very faintly. Can you um, increase uh, your volume or move closer to the microphone? How, can you hear me now? That's better. Thank you. Sorry, everyone in the room. Um, so I, I think the work you're doing, James, just seems to me like um, a very direct way to be sort of addressing some of these more um, systemic um, social economic disparities uh, and then your point that this is really sort of touching on gentrification I think there are there are definitely policies that I think that should be um, considered and is the mic still on yes. yeah okay yes. um, I know there's work being done here in Atlanta I think somebody was talking from Walt yesterday um, there's work being done to try to to prevent displacement in in areas where we are developing really quickly and smart um, technologies definitely will be adding to the patterns of displacement. There was a second question of how do we quantify the smart and connectedness in quotes of a community and present that information in a way that it will allow it to have impact um, from what I've seen, actually, Pew Center for Internet and American Life certainly has um, a great base of questions and research that I've seen over the last uh, five years. I just mentioned one study, the demographics of device ownership. It's a very basic, easy to do study, but you can repeat that question. It's a direct enough question that it's not. There's not a lot of subjectivity to it. If you ask. I found in, in my research and, and actually working with UNC Charlotte students on graduate projects, um, creating survey designs that are less uh, um, you know, hard to interpret. If you ask someone, do you get online? Well, they're going to think, I have Facebook on my track phone, so I guess I'm online. That's, of course, not the same thing as can you help your child write an essay at home that's due tomorrow. They're just vaguely thinking of Facebook equals the internet. You find that also globally. When people have access to Facebook, um, that is the internet. And of course, we're more talking about uh, the ability to be productive and contribute to the conversation. So those direct questions, I think, would be uh, essential to that so that you can baseline um, other views. I would just say I think um, one way to quantify is um, taking note of, of how how much and in what ways citizens are engaging in existing decision-making processes in cities. Um, because I know 
um, I've, I've been involved in a lot of those efforts, and sometimes uh, they seem sort of more fluff <laughs> and um, less actually substantive, and you sort of start seeing the same people over and over. And I think if we really have smart and connected, especially communities, more people, broader diversity of people, new people will be showing up and, and feeling like they actually have a voice and can be involved in, in these processes. There's this technical question that I can answer, but I'd love to open it up and make sure the other cities. Yeah, that, that's actually why I just came up. I want to make sure that um, Lima and Baltimore are able to see the questions um, and respond to them just since we haven't, we haven't heard responses from those sites. So could somebody please confirm that you all can see the, see the um, uh, Poll Everywhere page? This is Baltimore. I can confirm that we can hear the speaker and we can see in the compliment screen the actual question. Okay, you can see the screen with the questions. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Well, to to so certainly, there is a question about uh, how do we ensure open source software is secure and usable for a long time without a centralized update system? The Linux kernel receives updates regularly, but what about software not included in the kernel? Essentially, how can we prevent the devices from becoming abandonware? Um, just to get out of the weeds a little bit, um, for the sake of um, clarity, because there are a lot of engineers and other forms of academic specialists here, open source software is what runs Android. Open source software is what runs a Chromebook. Open source software is what runs Facebook, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. People don't run Windows um, for a lot of stuff. They don't certainly run major websites on Mac OS. That means those corporations that rely on it contribute to it. So essentially you're getting, and even Microsoft's uh, CEO, Satya Nadella, um, said, hey, Microsoft loves Linux. We're going to, so this is an alternative. This is essentially when we talk about you know, as we had earlier in the conference, issues about capitalism and uh, more socially uh, uh, progressive ways of, of, of doing urban development, the same thing has happened in computer science. Do we allow only what is going to make more money for one or two companies that make an operating system, Apple and Microsoft, to dominate, where they have a incentive to continue to drive sales year over year? Or do we make it an international project that is uh, open for pr use as a for-profit tool, like Google does when they sell you an Android phone or, or sells Android to phone makers? Or they can make it a completely uh, open source endeavor like Ubuntu or Red Hat with Linux. They, um, they don't provide any ideology regarding the economics of that. Because of that, you have corporations who have uh, well compensated co uh, people contributing to the base constantly and you also have average people in every language on earth who can say this isn't in my language I'll add the translation and now everybody in my country can use this technology so it basically prevents itself ever from being abandoned if one person makes an improvement and it is peer-reviewed which is the core of open source just like academic knowledge that body of operating systems, that body of code, becomes more resilient and more updated. So that's why we chose uh, partnering with those projects um, and saying, how do we make sure that it's just really easy to use, virus-free, and very easy to train a person who's not technical on it? It's a Atlanta question. Yeah, so the question, um, how can we in Atlanta replicate the used computer recycle model? Um, I was thinking about this a little while you were presenting, and we might need your help with that. I don't um, have any expertise in this area. I bet a bunch of people in this room do, but it seems like it might sure. be worth thinking. About sure. That. Well, there are... There are about 600 zero landfill rec electronic recyclers in the country. Um, we partnered with one of them, um, and we're modeling out what would you do, what the, are the processes. But I guess in the meantime, the main thing I would say is ask the question, and this is a very interesting question because I did it with uh, Brett here, I did it with the sustainability officer who was also a local panelist the, the other day. 
What does your organization, your campus, your business do with its computers when it's when they're no longer in use? And you'll be amazed the rabbit hole that appears that I don't know. Let me ask my facilities guy. It's nothing bad, but it's it's not like what happens when I throw away a soda can? Oh, it goes and it's picked up on Tuesday. It's a very quick, clear answer. That's how we get rid of certain kinds of waste. What do we do with our unused computers? What do people in dorms do with their unused computers? Those are questions that you can begin to ask. And then I would love to be in contact with you on what answers come up and how do we find ways to partner with local nonprofits and workforce development organizations to say, you know, how do we train youth in your city to use that as something that they can begin building as a pilot for an, a nonprofit who can distribute that in a, a particular neighborhood and then watch the results. Does that help with homework um, completion rates or other things in a, in a study? And that's what we're also doing here at UNC Charlotte. So I'd love to be in contact with anyone who has questions about that. I guess um, Brett uh, is able to share contact information sure. um, with with anyone. Um, so yes. Let's just see here. Okay. Wanted to. Uh, there are questions for me, and I definitely appreciate them uh, regarding digital divide. I wanted to. I see there's a the newest one. It's a long, a two two line one. I'd love to see if someone else wants to address that in, in fairness to the to all sites. Uh, and if not, then I'll pick up the uh, tech tech related questions. The question that just came in, in case um, people are having trouble seeing it, is as we work to improve sustainability, especially in urban environments with high levels of diversity and race, uh, gender identity, lang language, and many more, how can we make sure that the voices of minorities uh, who might even be the most impacted by these changes are heard? So I, I think um, this question, I think, is something that all uh, panelists uh, touched on. So I'm wondering if we could um, work our way around uh, some responses uh, to this question. Do we have um, uh, maybe Rochelle in uh, Baltimore or uh, David Chavez uh, in uh, Lima? Okay, well, um, okay. not getting a response from those sites, so uh, okay. James, do you want to? All right, so there were questions that I would like to kind of address together. One was um, three minutes ago, do, do you have plans to have other sites like in Baltimore? So I'm glad that there's also interest in Baltimore as well as Atlanta. I would, again, love to be able to have um, dialogue with you and uh, we do have a reach in terms of our collection sites so we can do pilots that are in other parts especially of the east coast uh, and do all of the heavy lifting the literal like getting thousands of pounds of computers moved around uh, handled and then we can pilot that here in Charlotte with our youth and we can share results and, and expand uh, it's just a matter of uh, getting in touch um, and again the site is informative Inc.com. If you there's a uh, contact form, but more to the benefit of everyone here. Um, one, there's a question about the impediments to bridging the digital divide, and then somewhat similar, how common are simulations or uh, are simulations of tech user behavior? Um, is there an assumption that smart connected cities will be free lab rats for tech developers? Um, so, one, you have an aspect of um, making a, st a smart city kind of like a tech hub, the way that you might uh, create an innovation hub for a city by creating co-working spaces and, and then you run a, a pipeline of gigabit fiber there. Um, and the, the other, the, there is an important, and I think just as we had, as someone said, well, how do we make sure the voices of minorities and others are heard? That's certainly what I would like, I, I advocate for within the tech community. Um, uh, you have serious issues um, 
even with the, the digital divide uh, question. If you take San Francisco, obviously I have no problem with hearing voices of minorities as, a, as a, an ideological goal. But only 2% of the workforce of uh, Twitter, Google, and Facebook are African American and Latino in California, which is, I think, majority minority if it's not, certainly in its major cities. So, uh, except, uh, except for San Francisco proper. Um, which means that you have to actually think about certain, you have to, if you're going to go in with the community, I, I would advocate for that mentality that technology on its own will rise all boats is, is, is quite erroneous and that would be an impediment to bridging the divide. You have um, an issue with housing in San Francisco because there's so many successful technologists there that people can't afford to live there. These are things that I see in the comments certainly that we don't want to replicate. But I would say this um, to just close out the, the comment on this. I, I give Google um, some strong uh, admiration because they did say we're going to partner, for example, with HBCUs and hire computer scientists, students, or underclassmen interested in computer science and nurture them at our campuses. One of our first students, a young African American lady who never built a computer before, is now graduated high school, high poverty high school, and is going to be one of the first people from the Charlotte area enrolled in that program. And she's wants to continue the internship with us. So we are starting to get the first taste of, hey, now we're going to have major companies see that when you do those kind of, I guess, for lack of a better term, hand-holding arrangements where you're listening more, um, you're going to see interesting developments in talent. And when, you're, when you see them see better qualified candidates are coming from areas that they would not have thought of for recruiting, then I think that also helps with... Um, their involvement on expanding those programs. Uh, uh, again, here's more of a generic question. I'll just make sure everybody hears it. Um, I won't necessarily respond to it first. Tech is a huge part of city, smart cities that presents lots of like, opportunity, but also skepticism. Are there any best practices for communicating uh, smarts uh, to, for any best practices for, I guess, smart city communities? That I'm just reading so everyone can uh, hear the question properly. I think it might have been actually how to communicate or like explain what smart cities are since there is skepticism. I think oh, I see. I'm sorry. Yeah. For, okay. Oh, you know, they, they have a, they got it. Got it. So, a, another post right above it. But yes. So it's the best practices for communicating smart cities, I guess, as an idea to communities. Yeah. So best practices for communicating the idea of smart cities to communities. That's, that's I think, open to every perspective. Um, I, I want to go back, actually, to the question before that um, about how, as we're doing this work to improve sustainability um, in urban diverse areas, how do we make sure voices of minorities, um, especially groups that are particularly being impacted by these changes, are heard? And I think you just mentioned this, Jane, like hiring folks like from community, you know, like taking people's time seriously. Because like when I'm doing research on the West Side, I'm being paid um, to be at a meeting, right? But um, a lot of people, you know, if you're expecting community members to just come to meetings and um, make their voices heard, we need to be really uh, aware of the time and the energy that it takes to, to get out and to do things like have childcare if we're having a late night meeting or like a workshop or make sure that we're planning it at a time when people who have, you know, regular hours um, can come and making it close to public transportation so people who don't have access to cars can get there. Um, so lots of, lots of things. Certainly. Well, I guess with communicating smart cities or any other kind of uh, um, development, I found even with communicating technology, and we have represented from the, from the library system too, just communicating digital inclusion. Like, why should I care that I don't have a computer? When, when, um, when these things are brought out, you have to keep in mind that if you 
if you have a, an audience that is going to say, what is important to me is my health care or my livelihood or my children, um, crime, or whatever it might be, certainly speak in terms of what's relevant to their concerns. I would give an example of um, the healthcare community. Now in Charlotte, um, both major healthcare providers have virtual visits. Well, that makes it really important to have broadband. I don't have to take time off work. I can go on a lunch break, pull out a laptop, or go home if I need some privacy for an ag certain kinds of examinations and just have a webcam secure linked to the hospital and do a checkup visit instead of taking time take to, to take a bus to and from work and lose out or possibly lose my employment. Those are things that you can use to explain the, the viability of um, this idea as really helping them. And if that is something of interest to them, would they like to hear more uh, versus um, another kind of highfalutin topic and it's like, I have $10 an hour to make and you're wasting my time. Even if you're trying to help, that's essentially what they're going to do especially when they have uh, um, pressing obligations that they're going to, that, that, that even if they're interested now, they're going to forget about um, tomorrow. Uh, can I just piggyback on that a little bit? Um, yeah. Making sure, we want to make sure that we actually are listening. So, um, for instance, on the west side when we were talking about environmental planning efforts, folks wanted to bring it back to jobs and that was their priority. And so if, if people are voicing that, um, but that's being ignored because the planning group went in there to specifically come up with an environmental management plan, they're, it's going to discourage people from engaging and it really it doesn't help us as well. Um, and so that kind of relates to the who's defining smart city. So if we go in and we're trying to define it for people, it might mean a different thing for a different community. And so being kind of open to hearing new definitions of what it, what it really means um, is important, I think. I think we have time for response to maybe one more of these that's come in. Uh, a couple of uh, comments and questions came in. So maybe concluding remarks um, uh, quickly going around. I think we have a, just a couple more minutes in this session. Around the horn kind of thing? Yeah, okay. Let's see if anybody chimes in. Okay. Um, go ahead if you have something. Okay. Just to conclude again, I am very honored uh, and humbled to be a part of this uh, conference. And uh, I certainly uh, don't have the bravado of maybe some startup CEOs. I don't have all the answers. And certainly technology is not the answer. Um, uh, there's a great book um, by Andrew Keane that was presented at South by Southwest about two, three years ago called The Internet is Not the Answer. It's a wonderful book about a lot of the things that everybody throughout the conference mentioned. Um, we have fake news now, stuff that didn't even exist when that book was published three years ago that shows just even connectivity doesn't solve everything. You have to have a lot more community um, around what you're doing. I would say that um, someone asked about citizens, neighborhoods, nonprofits, businesses. Uh, that's who I work with and academics. I want to have something that is academically viable, possibly peer reviewable as a true solution to e-waste and digital divide, digital inclusion, um, not just for America, but globally. I am happy to listen and just uh, again, briefly, you can uh, email me at jwalker at informativeinc.com or just visit informativeinc.com and drop a line. I'd love to hear more of what I'm missing and what I don't have right, uh, not just you know, uh, positive comments, um, because we want to make sure that this is something that goes beyond our region. So thank you again for your time and interest. Great, thank you. Are there any other um, uh, panelists that have a, a, a concluding remark? Okay, well let's um, let's. Um, oh, oh say, Emma, are you? I'll just say thank you um, for for putting this on. It's been really interesting. I think good that we're having these conversations. Great, thank you. Well, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. And uh, we've reached the end of this session. Thank you.